Hi guys and welcome to the Lifestyle Design Secrets podcast where we talk about fitness, nutrition, mindset and a whole lot more. Thank you for everyone who's listened to all our episodes so far and taken the time to leave a review. If you do enjoy this episode and want the free content to keep on coming, please do take two seconds to leave us a five star review. Hello everyone and welcome back to the show. Today I've got Jess Anderson from Nourish and Bloom Mama. So Jess and I have been following each other on Instagram for probably about a year now with a few mutual friends, um, one being Paula Moore who lots of you know, um, and I do some work with Jess's husband as well on his building business. But why I really got Jess here today is because Jess is a sort of pregnancy, postpartum and baby nutrition specialist. I'll let her introduce herself properly in a minute (laughs) because I'm not doing her justice. But the reason I wanted to talk to Jess today and have been wanting to for a really long time is that I'm obviously 34. Now, finally eight months pregnant, um, which is awesome, but it's taken me a long time to get here. And I think I was just saying to Jess before we recorded, um, it's not a scientific problem. I've just been a contraception Nazi because from the age of about 15, um, the fear of God has been put into me about getting pregnant, how awful it's going to be, how it changes your life. Um, And just in general, since being pregnant, even I've noticed that the modern world really isn't designed to make child rearing in its traditional form easy or enjoyable. And that's where I believe a lot of women struggle. So from everything, from nutrition, through to lifestyle factors, and how much of the motherhood struggle is actually down to society these days in the modern world I'm going to grill Jess <laughs> but so let's start off with some saucy starters and I'm going to get Jess to introduce herself and give us a little bit of background to her journey Jess can you share a little bit about yourself and what inspired you to start Nourish and Blue? Absolutely and thank you so much Amy for having me here and to all your audience hello and it's yeah it's great to have you all listening along as well so I am a mother of two I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old I am a certified nutrition consultant for mothers and babies so I specialize in pregnancy postpartum and baby nutrition I'm also a qualified early childhood teacher Um, so I was teaching before having children and then I had my first child and sort of through that journey of becoming a mother, I realized that there was a lot that needed to be done in the area of baby nutrition. And that really started my own journey. And then once I looked into the baby nutrition, I quickly realized that actually, it's so interlinked with a mother's nutrition as well. And so it was an obvious next step for me to then look at postpartum and pregnancy nutrition as well. And so I firmly believe all of them go hand in hand. And I do believe that a nourished mama links to a nourished baby and vice versa. We've got to do it together and we've got to look at both the mother and baby together because They go forward together and they're so related in so many ways. You know, if we think about, this is a whole probably another podcast topic, Amy, (laughs) but, (laughs) uh, you know, the mother-baby diet and how close that is and the connection that we form with our babies. Of course, we are so linked in all areas and, um, yeah, it's such a special time of a woman's life to be walking beside them. And so, yeah, my... My business was inspired by my own journey to becoming a mother. And now I've started it, it's it's become, and I think you'll probably resonate with this, Amy, you know, having your own business is the ultimate personal growth journey for yourself. Um, and as you grow on your journey, your business represents who you are becoming and who you're growing into. And so 
for me in motherhood, it gives me a place where I can be creative and I can express myself and where I can connect with other women who are in this same space and same season as me and, and show them an alternative way. Yeah. Well, that's how so many great entrepreneurs start, right? Or even coaches or anyone. It's the pain points that you're suffering yourself. Yes, you absolutely. See other people. Mm. And people start to ask you, how do you do this? And how did you manage that? And these conversations start, this is what happened to me anyway, and these conversations start seriously happening all the time mm -hmm. to the point where, you know, people literally always want to start paying you. And it's like, okay, <laughs> maybe, maybe I do need to do this so that I can actually help people um, legitimately, which is a huge gift, right? Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like yeah, holding... Yeah holding space for anyone is it's a huge thing but to hold space for mothers there's another layer there for sure because you are navigating so many other things with mothers you know you've got layers of guilt layers of grief you know there's so many conversations to have to be had and for so many mothers they're just looking for someone who gets it someone who is like sitting with or has sat with or has experienced or knows the answers to what they're sitting with or can sort of shine a light forward I was talking about that on my Instagram this morning like how can we shine a light forward and lead the way that's really um yeah what I love most about it I think that's incredible Jess and that's what another part of the intro I wanted to do before we dive into mm. the meaty main course which mm. is probably quite an quite an apt name for it given the topics we were just discussing before we got on um I'm hoping this conversation with Jess today is going to be really insightful for anyone who is thinking of starting a family in the future so I've already got a few clients younger than me um clients and friends I might add who are thinking of starting a family or want to one day and they're already going holy shit, you're going to have to tell me how you're doing this because I thought pregnancy was awful. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, and even my mother-in-law said to me the other day um, that she had a conversation with a 24-year-old who said, um, I don't think I want to have kids because it's going to ruin my body. What? So I know. So there's, I think, hopefully, like you say, shining a light and leading the way forward on a positive, positive kind of pregnancy birth and postpartum experience and also motherhood mm. um, but also I think this conversation could possibly be quite healing for many mothers who are already mothers or may now even be grandmothers who um, possibly wish they'd done some of this stuff or had a bit more of a support network in place mm -hmm. because I think a lot of what we're told as women, the more I dive into the literature, the amount that we've been told over the last 10, 20, 30 years, um, you know, just shut up and listen to your doctors, mm -hmm. basically. So throughout pregnancy, throughout the birthing experience and afterwards, um, without getting too political, there are so many different agendas at play <laughs> these days. And I think a lot of women's struggles um, from like a sort of a struggle through pregnancy of being told what they should and shouldn't eat mm -hmm. struggle through birth because they get told it's painful so they submit to types of pain relief that may you know make other aspects of birth more difficult and that obviously leads into the postpartum journey as well so it's a it's a multi-layered oh absolutely and I approach. think um the biggest thing for any mother right from the beginning is listening to your own instincts and they are there for a reason, but it's the hardest thing you'll do. It is the hardest thing and knowing that you can trust yourself and sort of shut off um, from that external noise. Not necessarily, I'm definitely not encouraging your listeners to ignore their health advice um, from their health professional, but more like the well-meaning friends and families, uh, future mother-in-laws always <laughs> seem to be quite good at this. Um, but yeah, 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 they come through with the goods for sure. But it's, yeah, it's, it's 
the perfect opportunity if you allow it to be pregnancy to begin your journey which will be absolutely necessary in motherhood of setting boundaries and also protecting your own energy of what you'll take on and what you'll listen to and what you'll believe as well because as you know Amy you know what we believe is what becomes and if we believe something to be true then it's more likely that we're going to see that as well. Absolutely your thoughts lead to your reality right your thoughts Mm -hmm. are in your only reality yeah exactly. Um, because everyone sort of lives in their head to a certain extent yeah and I think that's yeah that's another reason why I'm really excited to have this conversation and do some myth busting but have some positive chats about the whole experience as well because gosh all I've heard is people go how are you going and I do really appreciate it (laughs) because pregnancy is very tiring but honestly you'd think I had some form of stage four cancer I know um (laughs) so it's it's quite interesting um and I think yeah it's we should get into it before I get off on another different topic um so on to the meaty main course I'm gonna ask Jess all about Mm -hmm. pregnancy and postpartum nutrition and baby nutrition as well. And I'm actually going to start with a topic that made me laugh, um, but I think it will lead ourselves quite well into the the debate we were having before we got on. Not a debate, (laughs) Jess and I are probably having a debate with the rest of the world. (laughs) Um, As soon as I got pregnant, people started going, how are you coping without eggs? Oh, yes. How are you coping without deli meat on the platter? How are you coping without cheese? Yeah. And I was like, well, guys, I'm still just eating them all. Yeah. Um, and I think, so there's some wild, wildly inaccurate pregnancy nutrition advice out there in my eyes. Jess, mm-hmm. what's your opinion? Mm. I think there's a lot of misinformation and I think there's also a lot of fear surrounding it because the whole thing I have found in motherhood is, and this begins in pregnancy, is that a mother will do anything to protect her child and that begins in pregnancy. And so if she is told that, you know, if you eat eggs, there is a risk of X, Y, Z, then of course she's going to go, well, I don't want to knowingly put my baby at risk. So I'm not going to have eggs. And then I look at that and think, well, yes, I see. But let me talk into actually what the research shows us. And also, if you're not having eggs, has the person who told you that eggs are so dangerous in pregnancy also told you about the risks of deficiency for choline? Because eggs are rich in choline and so is liver. Those are like the two hand in hand that are going to give us the most choline. And choline's crucial for our baby's brain development. However, if you're not having eggs, it's probably likely you're not having liver either. And so then where are you getting your choline from? Studies show us it's around 3% of pregnant women meet their needs for choline and so wow that's alarming to me seriously alarming and so um those people who consume eggs have approximately double the intake of choline as compared to those people who don't so let's talk about eggs and go into it because if if all the people do from listening to this is eat eggs in pregnancy i will be happy um however you know the there is a risk, but I feel like with many things there is, and it's actually understanding um, the risk factors so that you can make an informed decision rather than just making this blanket rule of let's not have eggs in pregnancy at all. So <clears throat> let's yeah, go. And the, Jess, you, mm. no, the, I think it was a book called, um, well, you mentioned Lily Nichols, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Real food for pregnancy. Mm. I think Mm. she outlines the stats in there Mm. that salmonella from uncooked eggs is something like one in five million chance of occurring. And you don't even really get salmonella in free range eggs anyway, which is now all we have in New Zealand. Yes. Yes. So So I think it's the risk management, like you say, 
women, pregnant women are told to not eat eggs, which is absolutely obscene in my eyes. Yes, to- I totally, yeah. totally agree. And um, this, the research I have is says it's a one in 20,000 chance that an egg is contaminated with salmonella. But like, one in 20,000 is like, it's one in a million, you know, like these are, it's yeah. such a low risk there. Um, egg related food poisoning accounts for 3% of all reports. And there's actually a higher risk of getting food poisoning from fruits and vegetables than from eggs. And so like leafy greens, they're one of like the highest things because you've got to be mindful of because they sit around for ages and you do need to be mindful of that and ensuring you're eating fresh produce. we When it comes to eggs, there are things that you can do to minimize the risk even further, but also like one in 20,000, that's huge. Um, So it's the chances of it happening are lower in certified organic birds rather than the conventionally raised birds. And so um, you're wanting to look for those, yeah, free range eggs, organic, ideally if you can, but it's when um, the conventional chickens, you know, they're kept in really close quarters and that's where the infection can spread quickly, which is why most industrialised farmers are giving, you know, antibiotics because they've got these birds in the close quarters. And so if we look at the prevalence of salmonella in the faecal samples that we can see the studies show us that it's 40 percent from conventional chickens versus 5.6 percent from organic so it's a huge difference so not only can you drop it down from like one in twenty thousand, you can then go okay well then i'm going to take it further and actually try and buy organic um or i'm going to go and get free range and like i always just say trust your gut you know your instincts um with this as well but looking for fresh eggs that you know where they've come from, you know where they've been raised, you know, that's that's going to help um, definitely mit- mitigate any risks here. But if you're not having eggs, if you choose that path, then having liver is what I would say <laughs> necessary or an alternative quality choline supplement to ensure that you're getting that in there. And so Jess... For mm. the lay people out there, before we get back onto eggs, because yeah. I'm about to, um, what's your favourite way to eat liver? Because I am a lazy, I feel like Jess is like the ancestral cooking queen who actually <laughs> makes her own pate every one of bone broth. Whereas I go to the supermarket and buy the French mm-hmm. little, have you seen that brand? Yes, what's it called? Yeah. Um, Authentique, yeah. I think. Yes, that's it. Yes, I have, yeah, I know the one, yeah. So that's what's, where my, I get my what, liver. what's my but favorite? That's what I think. Did you say? Oh, yeah, sorry, Jeff. <laughs> Talking yeah. to the, so, what? Um, what in your eyes? What's the most kind of accessible way for people to incorporate liver? Um, well, it depends. If they're open to trying to cook it, then definitely chicken liver pate, which people can find on my Instagram. I shared uh, the full recipe the other day. It's three ingredients, super easy, super simple. Still, that will be a barrier for some people, knowing where to buy them, how to actually cook them, actually handling liver. Like when I first started cooking it myself, I used to, I couldn't even touch it because it was just, it was quite, um, it was so it's new to me. Yeah. And it's a very, they're, they're very smooth textured and it was just so foreign to me that I used to just sort of open them and tip them into the serve and then they'll go straight in the pan like they wouldn't get touched by me at all whereas now I can handle them and I when I'm working with mums I sort of show them what you're looking for and things like that but because you do want to see like a beautiful smooth liver that's really our um goal and in New Zealand if you're listening in New Zealand uh Bostock's brothers they do the best chicken products and their livers are like gold standard in my opinion um so that's what I was going to ask Jess so Bowstocks, chicken livers mm-hmm. that I see at New World. That's what we're talking about, hey? Yes. Super yeah. accessible. Super yeah. accessible. Like often um, the New World local to me, I live in Monica in New Zealand, South Island, and we have livers every week, you know, and often they're discounted. So they're, they're like 
eight dollars or nine dollars and then they get discounted down to six dollars and i'm like six dollars six dollars for one of the most nutrient dense foods i will take it absolutely because it's because they're still like frowned upon they're not cool they're not sexy unless you're no. in the like ancestral nutrition community yes. we're the weirdos yes yes we are <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm happy to be a weirdo when I know the nutrients I'm getting. And yeah. liver, you can sort of, you can look at it like your food-based multi, basically. You know, it covers such okay. a wide range of nutrients in there that it's like a one-stop shop, basically. And our ancestors, they prized the liver. Like it was... It was saved. It was sacred. It was saved for the woman. It was saved because they knew the power of what was in there. And instinctively, it was like it was just um, a no brainer for them really to have it. So, yeah. if, if pate is not going to um, happen in your kitchen, then you can get like because livers become still not mainstream, but it's definitely becoming more popular. Um, you know, you can get liver powder pretty much supplements can't you in a pill yeah really and, yeah so you can get it and sprinkle it in your meals or you can get it in capsules and take it in capsules i really like the cell squared capsules i um yeah i really like their processing and their brand and their business and what they stand for um and so yeah if that's not an option for people and so obviously when we're talking about liver as well um with the vitamin a content i know that's definitely something that um it's also sort of people are um, that's what i got i got sworn against vitamin a yes when i got pregnant yes and so um all the research i can send an article through for your listeners to have a read through but you know, we do need to be mindful of how potent liver is. It is an incredibly potent food. And if you are new to it, or if you're new to any food, I always say, just take it slow and listen to your body and see what it says. But all of the research around the liver that's come out with all the warnings, it's actually from the synthetic version of it. And so that's something that we really need to talk more about. It needs to be spoken about more because vitamin a is really important in pregnancy as well and i feel like it's another thing that's um yeah it's i don't want to say fear-mongering but there is a bit of that going on with it so i will happily send you through a, an article where people can read more about yeah i would love to read that because i the last thing i heard about vitamin a was when i used to take roaccutane when i, I had would... terrible acne mm. <laughs> many many years ago it's probably to do with the sugar in our sight, but um, the sugar and the hormones. But, um, yeah. yeah, and they test you to check if you're pregnant every month because of the high yeah. dose of vitamin A. So it'd be really good to see the research on consuming natural liver and the safety of it because yeah, I'm sure and most people would feel better eating a little bit of it than not at all, which I'm pretty sure most people yes, totally most people don't eat liver unless you actively try and add it into your diet. Yeah, and like a quarter of a woman don't consume enough vitamin A. And so requirements then increase in pregnancy further than that. And so that ends up making a third of pregnant women deficient in vitamin A. And so the conventional guidelines for pregnancy nutrition caution against too much but they're also not recommending or promoting sufficient intake and so we're sort of in this gray area where people feel scared to eat any but they're also not meeting their needs and so yeah. excess intake of vitamin a has been shown to contribute to birth defects which is the the part that people yeah. are wary about of course um this is most common with the use of synthetic vitamin a which i mentioned before and which is found in many supplements and topical products and so um i feel like that is the part that we need to really be sharing more um yeah. and talking more about yeah we just get the headline, don't we? Yeah. Um, speaking of, I wish I had my little booklet on like pregnancy nutrition that the midwife gives you because holy hacker, in my opinion, it was quite shocking. Oh, <laughs> so I'm going to... You had it so we could go through it. Oh, 
Well, I'll tell you what, some of this is applicable. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I'm going to really trigger Jess here. Um, so oh. Jess has an absolute obsession with butter. <laughs> and I can't wait to ask her about it because on a daily basis, mm. not even pregnant women, but women in general, I come across a huge amount of women who are terrified of eggs in normal life, not even pregnancy. You can't eat that many eggs, can you? Butter and the fat on meat. Mm -hmm. They think it's awful. The amount of women who come in to see me for a consultation and go, I only eat red meat once a week or twice mm -hmm. a week. Like that makes them, you know, they're polishing their halo because they limit mm. their consumption of red meat. And instead they're eating cereal bars. I'd love your thoughts. <laughs> I've been waiting for that question. Um, because just again, the, the pregnancy move. guidelines still are even like, mm. you know, cut the fat off your meat, mm -hmm. lean meat only, and recommending seven to eight servings of grains a day. Yes. Yeah. I feel like, um, okay, before we move on, I just want to finish that liver conversation by saying um, that if you're new to liver, please start slowly. I'm just conscious that in, in case any listeners <laughs> are sitting out there going, okay, I'm just going to eat all the liver. Okay, so we do want to do this in, in moderation in pregnancy. And yeah. so it's not, I never recommend anything in excess. Always listen to yourself. But if you are avoiding it because you're fearful of the risks with vitamin A, know that that actually comes from the synthetic version. And so, yeah, uh, the mindful consumption could look like eating chicken liver pate a couple of times a week or taking some desiccated liver pills every other day, for example. Um, but yeah, I do a pate a couple of times a week. Yes, yeah. So I always just work with um, your own practitioner with that. And it's really nuanced, the, like, um, supplementation for pregnancy so I yeah people often ask me can I do this and I'm like well it depends because like your listeners I have no idea what else they're taking what other supplements they're taking and that is where we get into that gray area of like you could do this but is it actually going to tip you over the sort of higher end of the recommended daily intakes because you're already having it in a different form and like yeah it's something we need to be mindful of yeah it goes without saying all our chats today are not necessarily medical recommendations but they um they're pretty interesting and nuanced and should hopefully provide some kind of food for thought yeah and i think what jess has highlighted there with the synthetic version mm. is again it kind of comes back to that nature knows best yes yeah. like generally eating things instead of taking a pill yeah generally the better option I, you know, and now the further I get along my journey, I aim to get even my supplementations, I aim to get those from food as much as I can because they're much more bioavailable, absorption's much higher, you know, and the synthetic version, it's just, it's not as potent as what you're going to get from food and many nutrients actually work synergistically as well instead of isolation. And I feel like we've gone through this stage of, okay, so we're deficient in that. We'll just throw that at it. But it doesn't work like that always. And, you know, many things work hand in hand. And so we need to sort of zoom out and look at that. And I think there is isn't, you know, there is a time and place for targeted high dose supplementation for particular yeah. conditions but that's you've got to work with a practitioner to get the quality supplementations you know not just getting these from the pharmacy and hoping for the best I, mm. I yeah that's something I'm really passionate about actually because I feel like a lot of people are investing money into supplements that are low quality and they're just throwing their money away and it's yeah they're not getting anything back for it and they're not seeing the needle move with their health either where we can make so much impact by sorting out the foundations of nutrition. And then, as I say to my clients, then on top, let's do some smart supplementation as needed where we can see it's needed, but not just like throwing isolated nutrients at, yeah, at a problem. Does that make sense? I love that, Jess. Yeah, huge tangent, but I completely agree because women come to me and they're like, 
I'm taking this menopause multivitamin mm -hmm. and some magnesium, which is always the shittest, least absorbable form. Yeah. Because that's the cheapest on the shelves. Um, so women are trying, but the analogy I love is they're throwing icing and sprinkles on top of a cake that they haven't baked yet. Yes. Exactly. So they're eating um, a hell of a lot about um, the typical, the the average when clients come to me, um, women are eating about, women and men, I should say, I also work with men, eating about 45 teaspoons of sugar equivalent mm -hmm. of carbohydrates per day. Mm -hmm. Very, very deficient in protein. Mm -hmm. Everyone, that's across the board. And they're all struggling not to overeat, struggling to lose weight, struggling with energy levels, blaming the menopause, and it's like, no, no, hang on, guys. Let's take it back a step. Focus on what you're putting in. Get some real food in there instead of the processed things that we've been told are good for us, that labels tell us are good for us. Yeah. Um, getting back to basics. And then I think we talk about, like, the most common supplement I'd probably recommend is magnesium to most mm -hmm. people. But um, it's... Kind of, yeah, you talk about that after you've got everything else. Yeah, and magnesium, Sorted. you know, it, it is tricky with food for that. So often it is needed um, for supplementation depending on the person. But, uh, yeah, I feel like we sort of have got to the point where we're now just trying to throw supplements at things. And, yeah, it's not – there's no foundations to support that. And so our bodies aren't – yeah, they're not going to respond to that in the way that we desire them to. And we, I see the whole um, conversation around, you know, when you talked about the magnesium being those poor forms that are, you know, they're not well absorbed and they have other side effects as well, which is important to understand. And it's the same with, we're going on a bit of a tangent here, Amy, but let's roll with it. <laughs> That's all right. I'm bringing you back to eggs and to yes. not be afraid of fat. In yes. a yeah, we'll, yeah. Go, we'll go there for sure. But um this links in well with actually what I wanted to talk with your audience about with with iron because iron is so important in both pregnancy and for babies in fact at six months a baby's iron daily iron needs are higher than an adult male's so we need to take it seriously wow. and so one of the most commonly promoted things foods for babies is baby rice cereal it's still one of the number one recommendations here in New Zealand. And it is basically ground up rice with fortified, it's fortified with a synthetic version of iron. And that synthetic version of iron leads to constipation for babies. And one of like the leading issues mums have with babies is constipation. Yet we're recommending one of their first foods is a food that contributes to it. And so it's just, Oh my it god. Baffles me that um yeah that they see Jess, then you can prescribe them a baby laxative yes. or a baby antiacid. I know and the pharmacies win. It's just, and the cycle continues. And I feel like yeah. it's um I was going to say this at the beginning, you know, being a mother is one of the greatest privileges well of my life, like it is the greatest privilege to be raising children, but you have to have your wits about you these days. Like you do have to know which questions to ask. And then you have to know which questions to ask yourself as well and follow your intuition. Because if you follow the health star rating or the pregnancy guidelines that are given to you in a pamphlet, chances are you're not going to feel ideal or you're going to end up with like the constipation that comes from the synthetic iron that is in baby rice cereal. So the whole synthetic vitamins and nutrients that are added to our food is a whole other conversation, especially, you know, in New Zealand, I think it's important people know that we now have regulated folic acid added to bread. And like, But it's not just bread. Like if you look at a lot of your food products you're buying, chances are on the ingredients list you've got some synthetic vitamins, nutrients added in there. And it's actually understanding how much you're eating in a day of these ingredients and the impact they could be having as well. 
so many, <laughs> so many things to talk about. I know. These topics. I know. And I just so, want to finish. I'll just finish that yeah. on iron um, because it is something that's really important for your audience to understand because so many women go through pregnancy just holding on to their levels of iron and then they get into postpartum and it's, you know, it just keeps going down. And so it is really That's important. That's because your baby's drawing the iron it needs, isn't it, from your breast milk? Yes, yeah. Right. And so up until... Yeah. Up until six months, um, they they have enough from you. So, but it's important to understand that an infant's stores of iron at birth are adequate only if maternal stores were also adequate. So, it's important for a mother to be focusing on this in pregnancy, and then after those six months of either formula or breast milk it's adding in the iron rich foods. And so I feel like a lot of (laughs) recommendations can say, you know, like adding in cooked spinach, for example, is a really iron rich way to get, you know, your baby's iron needs met, but actually that's not the case. And I think, yeah. And talking about the absorption is something that I talk with all of my clients about, because this is what should be included in, baby pamphlets for starting solids like you need to know this and so um I'll share with you some work some research from Lily Nichols who I know you and I have spoken about Amy but if you haven't looked at her research around pregnancy postpartum fertility she is like the queen of real food for pregnancy and and motherhood in general and she shared that the difference between the actual content of iron in a food and the absorption and the difference is huge. So for example, to match the iron content of ground beef, so a hundred grams of ground beef would, you'd have to have half a cup of cooked spinach and you've got the same amount of iron content, but to match the iron absorption of ground beef, you would need a hundred grams of ground beef and then two and a half cups of cooked spinach and I don't know about you Amy but whenever I cook spinach it like wilts down to nothing so can you imagine how much like two and a half cups of cooked spinach is like it's insane it's yeah I was about to say yeah Jess you're probably about to go there anyway but while we're here yes let's touch on the best ways to get absorbable iron because Mm -hmm. people get I'm on Instagram like we all are looking at stuff from people like Lily Nichols scientifically Mm -hmm. backed with studies and then you'll see in the vegan community top iron sources and they'll list things like beans and chickpeas Mm -hmm. possibly not chickpeas but um these a lot of legumes and grains where actually your body's ability to absorb Mm. that iron is very limited. So Jess, what would you recommend people look for instead? Mm. Animal protein is really where the most iron is. If you are plant-based, it's important to understand how the food works in your body. Um, So for your listeners to know, there's two forms of iron. So we've got the hem iron and the non-hem. And so the hem iron is found in meat, seafood, and poultry. And for the absorption rate, we're looking at between 25 to 40% absorbable. And then the non-hem iron is found in plant foods and the iron fortified foods. So this is the, the fortification that I was talking about before that you're finding in things like baby rice cereal. And the absorption rate there is two to thirteen percent, and so on average, I think it's around Holy five, shit. it's around five percent. So it's a huge difference. And so when we look at the list of plant foods that are high in iron, so for example, if we talk about cashew nuts, right? So three quarters of a cup of cashew nuts has six micrograms of iron in there but actually only 0.18 of that is being absorbed. And so it's just, it's a huge difference. If you actually think about how much is being absorbed into your body, it's, and I feel like the amounts that need to be eaten is 
unrealistic. So, for example, to make... The amount of calories that you'd have to consume in order to get enough iron from plant foods... Would be really difficult. Would, would land you being pretty obese, to be honest. Well, I know. It would be, I feel like you would be ignoring a lot of your body's symptoms of saying I'm full, like the messages, you know. So to match the iron absorption of a chicken thigh... One, like 100 grams of chicken thigh, you need to eat three cups of pumpkin seeds. Like, I could not eat three cups of pumpkin seeds. And I wouldn't want to because my digestive yeah. system would just scream at me. Like, I, yeah, I think we need to, when it comes to grains and nuts and seeds, to make them easier to digest, we need to be cautious with them. We need to soak them or ferment them. We need to be cautious so that we're actually absorbing as much as we can from these foods. But there's just, I I don't see anyone, let alone a young baby who's just starting on solid foods, eating three cups of pumpkin seeds. It just, and it's the same with, so, um, and then if we look at, like no one is going to probably in one sitting have 100 grams of chicken liver. But this is Lily Nichols' research on this. She, she shares 100 grams of chicken liver to match that same absorption, you'd need six cups of cocoa powder. Who's going to have six cups of cocoa powder? And in what form, you know, like, yeah. It just, it, um, I think uh, for your audience, for those who are in the plant-based world. There are many of them, I don't think. Okay, but, but yeah. in, on the case that one stumbled across before, your world and mine, uh, in mind, I think it's yeah. important to understand that while some plant foods are high in iron, many of these foods also contain other compounds that actually decrease the absorption of iron. So we've got the phytic acid, the oxalates, some tannins as well, and the fiber. These yeah. can all like reduce down the absorption of the iron in our foods. And so mindful, you need to be mindful of that. Um, and yeah, for any plant-based clients, I personally don't work one-to-one -one or in group settings with plant-based because I personally believe that if you choose the plant-based route, you'd need to work with a practitioner to ensure that you're meeting your needs. And especially in pregnancy um, and the, yeah, in such a like highly nutritiously demanding period of life like yeah you need yeah. to make sure you're covering your bases and I'm not saying that in to impart any fear or anything like that this is the reality in my opinion that yeah it needs to be looked at and you need you know I'm all for supporting people to eat in the way that feels aligned for them but make sure that you're doing it in a way that's covering your needs so that you feel good and you know that you're like you feel good in yourself and your body and your energy and you know that you're meeting your nutrient needs as well yeah I think I'd have to agree with you there Jess because I do work with the very occasional plant-based client and full a vegan clients a couple of them one of them was a 21 year old girl who hadn't had a period for mm -hmm. years and we got her period back within a couple of weeks by incorporating a lot of those much better plant-based foods. So from, mm -hmm. you know, from a really quite a dirty protein shake, which was the one thing that she was having that had whey in it, which was an interesting choice. But, um, and like, you know, very bland nutrient, nutrient lacking foods. Um, we incorporated a lot more nuts and seeds and things like that. And that really helped her. But I think, you've hit the nail on the head in pregnancy. I'm going to need to find the study because this is a bold claim, mm. but they're actually saying it's, it's close to abusive to be completely plant-based during pregnancy mm -hmm. because of the impact it can have. Mm -hmm. and um, it's bold. It's quite sure, a serious Amy, topic. Yeah. I, I can see because there's some nutrients that we just need to supplement. And if we're not, then we need to, yeah, get some support to do that. Yeah. So I think that's one to look at with caution. Um, but so yeah. Jess, 
Maybe us back because we promised to come back to oh, yes. eggs, butter, and fat on meat. Yes. Um, but it's actually quite a nice segue because the clients I work with are not plant based. Yeah. But the reason they come to me yes. is because they're overweight, yeah. uncomfortable, yeah. lacking energy. Yeah. They say they eat meat, but they're trying to limit it. They yeah. live off grains, they live off cereal and toast, they live off sushi rice based sushi yeah um you know rice cakes and crackers um because they're all low fat and they avoid eggs and butter and fatty meat because they're concerned about the cholesterol yeah what are your thoughts oh i feel um i feel sorry for them initially not because of any like victim mindset or like um, anything to do with that more just because um, the information we're being bombarded with is leading us astray and it's disconnecting us from what we know to be true and what our bodies are telling us and particularly in motherhood you know it's such an intense time nutritionally as I've mentioned our needs are higher during this time and to be running off limited sleep and cereal bars or crackers or plain toast it's almost like guaranteeing you to be a grumpy mama you know like it's you're not going to experience even energy levels that are going to serve you in your day because we know particularly starting your day in the morning with protein is the best way to set you up for that balanced mood the balanced energy levels and I was reading some research from the glucose goddess who I know that you've shared her work before Amy she's Um, brilliant oh she's so good and she was sharing that if we don't get our needs for protein in the day basically our bodies will continue to eat and eat and eat and eat until we hit that target and so if we're if we're not eating enough protein and then we're constantly hungry we're just looking and looking and seeking until we find it and yeah, starting your day with protein is one of the biggest shifts. Some of the mums I've worked with, it's the smallest change they've made and it's had the biggest impact. And they're like, what have I been doing? And I think, <laughs> I think you know, these plain, like I call them like naked carbs, right? The cereals, the toast, yeah. the crackers, Me too. The, the bagels, you know, they have their place, sure, but pairing them with some fat and protein is absolutely going to lessen the impact they have on your blood sugars and balancing your blood sugars can be nothing short of life changing for people. And I think it's something every, every woman needs to know, but particularly mothers. Um, and I think this, there's this really like you were sort of talking about at the start of this podcast around the conception of motherhood is like, Oh, you're tired all the time and you get 3 PM slumps and like, Oh, just got to get through the day. And it's like, how much of that is actually coming down to the food that we're eating? And I feel like we're being sort of pushed along towards these quick fix snacks where like my whole motto when it comes to nutrition is eat once, eat right, eat like right, not right as in these bad or good foods, but just eat in the way that's going to support your energy levels. Because I like that. Time is of the essence, right? I've got other stuff I want to do. I don't want to be making constant snacks for myself or for my children. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to like, right, let's, we're doing this. We're doing it, you know? So then I'm not going back to the cupboards, scrounging around for something else to like fill the gap for another 10 minutes. That's, that just to me, that makes me feel just so overwhelmed. And so if I can avoid that by focusing on the foods that, give us that long lasting satiation between meals, then yeah, that's where I'm going to, that's where I'm going to go. And um, talking about. Yeah, the- you nailed it with the, I think Jessie, when she was talking mm. about that, it's the protein leverage hypothesis. Yes. Yeah, which I try is. and explain to all my clients. Yeah. And I think just to explain it in lay terms for people again, listeners have probably heard me talk about it a few times. But you basically, you try and overeat something like a steak or a chicken breast. It's really, really, really difficult. Yeah. But how many bags of chips and chocolate bars, other bits and pieces, can you eat your way through 
on the way to eating a proper meal. Totally. Totally. And you so know, starting your day, yeah. your meal, like starting with protein as a cornerstone. Yeah. Like Jess says, eat, <laughs> eat once, eat right. Start with protein. You're very unlikely, and the right amount of protein as well. Yeah. I'm actually going to say this again. Jess, I've been talking about it a lot recently. Mm. Women go, oh, I have two eggs. Yeah. And I'm like, no, not enough. Yeah, not enough. And <laughs> yeah. I did pull out some research I wanted to share with you actually about pregnancy and protein Um, because while a mother's body will like mobilize some nutrients from her own stores like calcium. So for example, some of the calcium in a mother's bones will be reabsorbed to, in order to ensure that a baby is getting sufficient calcium levels, but others must be present, like other nutrients must be present in our diet. So it like really depends what nutrient we're talking about. But when we come to protein for breastfeeding mothers, if they consume the recommended daily allowance of protein for like a non-pregnant, non-lactating woman, she would need to mobilize about 19% of her lean tissue to support six months of milk production. Like we need to know this stuff because otherwise... Oh my god! All these are literally getting it just sucked up. Slapped. Yeah, we're getting slapped, and then then there's that whole conversation around you know the postnatal depletion. And there's a brilliant book that's by Oscar Serilac, which is really worthwhile reading if you are. What's it called? Um, the postnatal depletion cure, and it's just very much in line with what we're talking about here. Um, but for a mother who's listening to this, if you are six days, six weeks, six years postpartum, it doesn't matter. Postpartum like is for our life. And if you're still feeling the effects at six years, it's time to, you know, look at that, I think, um, and get some support for yourself yeah. because, yeah, there's so many things we can do. And in that book, he outlines a lot. And it's really what I do um, in my work with mothers a lot is like, okay, let's understand your nutrient needs as a breastfeeding mother or just as a mother who is in her own postpartum journey and how can we support your children so that they're growing because it's a lot you know you're thinking about your own needs and what's being depleted and what's getting depleted through breastfeeding and then you're also you know feeding your child at the same time and wanting to ensure they're getting everything they need and so it's yeah it can feel really overwhelming but I love just simplifying it for for parents and for mothers and and reminding them that actually what's good for them is great for us and vice versa and so how can we just bring nourishment for all that's it I love that and that Mm. leads us Mm. quite well Mm. onto some of the common misconceptions Mm -hmm. I've heard about nutrition during pregnancy and postpartum so a couple of the comments I've had you can eat whatever you want now Oh, yes. As if I've been struggling through life. Yeah. <laughs> now I've got a belly to hide it all. You yeah. see, me eat all the pies. Yes. Um, and cravings. Because, yeah. I'll tell you why. So some of my friends' cravings, and I wouldn't say I really had particular cravings. Mm-hmm. But what I did, I noticed, were for things like pork crackling, mm-hmm. quite high in calories, high in fat, mm. and citrus fruit, mm-hmm. which actually both together go into me... Mm choline collagen mm-hmm. and elastin mm-hmm. which you need for your stretching skin yeah and growing a baby yeah which I was fascinated by so what do you oh, I think it's quite harmful that women are told you can eat what you want now yeah given the gestational diabetes that's going on oh, no. um and cravings yeah so with cravings the research around them it doesn't really there's no sort of definitive answers around the purpose that they serve if they serve any um, it is hypothesized that, you know, the cravings that we experience in pregnancy can be protective for the health of the mother and baby. So like, yeah, we're trying to seek out foods that are going to satisfy that the demands of growing. Anything that you're missing. Yes. And like maybe replenishing yeah. nutrients that you've lost from vomiting or food aversions or nausea in the first trimester but common cravings that happen are sweet foods sour foods salty foods um there is an increase in blood volume during pregnancy so it can contribute to the cravings for those sodium rich foods fruit and citrus is really common um and of course if we think about that 
from you also the, need more liquid, don't you, for the blood volume? Yeah, and also the vitamin C in there helps us to absorb the iron. So, um, you know, with your orange craving, it kind of makes sense if you think about that as well. Um, dairy. That pop- was my friend Kylie was orange, and I was. I got real sciencey on it because I had. Um, I had low iron. Oh yes. Um, my first pregnancy test, and I was like. That is bizarre because you probably know a little bit about what I eat yeah. and I'm probably more out on the side of carnivore than vegan. Um, and I think it was um, possibly the amount of coffee I was drinking. Oh, the tannins, yeah. Yeah, so coffee actually um, depleting, well, preventing you from Absorb- absorbing iron, which I think yeah. is worth mentioning for anyone. Um, but, yeah, so combining that iron with vitamin C, yeah, for sure. And That's cooking, doing, which was very effective. Cook, cooking with a cast iron pan as well is really, um, oh, yeah. really effective. Don't consume iron with yeah coffee or black tea. Um, don't yeah. consume iron with calcium either. And yeah, cooking in a cast iron pan is really effective. Like it can increase the iron content of food by five to twenty nine times. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's worth doing for sure. But talking into um, eating whatever you want, I think there's so many layers to this, Amy, and the one that I'm choosing bravely to (laughs) the path I'm choosing to go down is I feel like there is a bit of um, or a lot of our relationship with food being played into this conversation around like good and bad foods and we are good or bad for eating particular foods and now that I'm pregnant I can just do what I want and I can get off this diet that I hate that makes me cranky anyway because I'm not actually getting the foods I need and now I'm just going to eat everything and not worry about it and I think we are abandoning ourselves in the process of actually listening to what we desire but also with my sort of philosophy with food yes I'm like an ancestral food queen I'm the first to say that I've got the crown I'm ready to go in the kitchen but I'm also really passionate about supporting people with their relationship with food because it's something I've had to heal for myself you know I grew up in an environment an eating environment where I had to finish all the food on my plate before I could get down from the table and one of the things I work with with parents is not passing that on to our children and how can we listen to them at meal times and it's a whole nother conversation, perhaps not for today, but I feel like... We I was have... about to say, in six months to a year's time, whenever I'm back on deck with this podcast, I'm going to get us back on and be like, what the hell do yeah. I feed them? Yeah. <laughs> like, with the solid start? Yeah, <laughs> anyway. we can do that. We'll yeah. um, I'm, I'm there with you as well. The I was brought up, obviously, in London. Kiwi dad, trying to feed me lamb chops every night of the week which in hindsight was quite quite good um but on the other side of things I had a lot of friends who are like vegetarian mm-hmm. and I had my parents going don't you know there are kids starving in Africa for mm-hmm. initial food yeah and it's all yeah. you know we look at well I look around and um reconnecting myself with my intuition and the the voice of my body has been something I've had to actively do And it comes from being told how much to eat. You know, we have these innate signals in our bodies of when we're full and when we're hungry. What if it was as simple as listening to that? And I know that there's so many nuances in here around disordered food relationships, and that's not a path I'm going to go down. But it's just actually in pregnancy and outside of pregnancy, knowing that you can eat any foods but no it's choosing powerfully I think and also knowing that so many foods that (laughs) you maybe are choosing to have as your um 20 percent or your like naughty food or I'm just going to treat myself with this it is so easy to make nourishing versions of those like it doesn't have to be this or that it can be both and it's finding a path that feels really good for you within that and I think the other part of this conversation is around like uh thinking about the child that is growing within your body and the nutrients they're taking and how 
um, you want to or you desire, your vision of how you want to feel in pregnancy and how the foods that you are nourishing and fueling your body with, how are they contributing to how you're feeling? And yeah, that's, I'm really conscious of the words that I'm saying here because I don't want to impart any guilt and I don't want parents to, or mothers, pregnant mothers to be like, ah, oh, I just, I feel guilty because I ate X, Y, Z. It's not about that. <laughs> it's not about guilt or shame for whatever you're eating. It's actually about no. um, respecting and honoring your body and knowing and knowing which foods to prioritize as well and um, knowing which options to pick if, you are looking for something with a chocolate flavor instead of like, oh, I just need something sweet. I'm like, oh, I feel like something chocolatey. So I'm going to have something chocolatey that also nourishes my body. And it's not yeah. either or for me. And it's, I think you and I are probably similar, Jess, but if you said eat what I want now, which I will tell everyone, I've eaten exactly what I wanted during pregnancy because I am so much hungrier. I'm eating mm. like double the portions of protein for breakfast, mm-hmm. but I mean double the portions of protein for breakfast, probably three or more times mm-hmm. the fruit yeah. I would normally eat. Yeah. But I love it. And yeah. my body obviously wants it. Yeah. I think the the key is that if you do feel completely uneducated on nutrition, you felt a bit tired and shitty and lacking energy before you got pregnant. Yeah. I think you know, it's really worth asking yourself that thing that you're reaching for that you feel is a craving that you want to grab and you're going, I deserve this, I can eat mm. it because I'm pregnant. Mm. How is that going to make you feel in half an hour? Yeah. In an hour at the end of the day. So that's what I always, there's um Chris Williamson, he has an amazing podcast. He talks about the 24 hour rule. It's like, how am I going to feel about this decision in 24 mm. hours? So without completely moving out of the present and living in tomorrow, mm. I think it's been such a, um, a powerful tool for me being pregnant because I am so much more hungry than mm-hmm. usual. But thinking, actually, if I decided, actually, I'm going to eat pizza for breakfast because that's what I feel like. I don't think I ever would. But... Am I going to be able to concentrate in an hour? Mm. And am I going to be sharp on a podcast? Mm-hmm. Probably not. I'm probably going to want a nap. Um, so rather than, yeah, thinking of foods as good or bad, thinking about how they're going to make you feel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and gifting gifting your future self with yeah. the food that you put in. Especially in motherhood. Like, we're already, you know, I am – the biggest advocate for making motherhood what you desire it to be. And I think food plays a huge role in that because it like we're, we've got a lot going on. And if we're also running on empty ourselves, it can really impact the way that we show up. And that's one of the main things I'm sharing with the mums I work with. Like let's show up as the version of ourselves that we want to, that we desire to for ourselves. So that our experience of this, right of motherhood can be different because we can't actually control the way our children show up at all all we can control is how we show up within that space and that yeah like that can land for so I feel like it's going to land for some mothers in your audience who yeah like it's um food in energy out is sort of the way that I look at it or food in mood out as well but it's yeah it's food in mood out I really like food in mood out because I think yeah, and I think a lot of women feel um, guilty about taking the time out to even learn about nutrition. Yeah. Um, or taking the time out for themselves to fuel themselves well, yeah. to learn what works, um, and to feed themselves when they feel like their child is a priority. Mm-hmm. And it's just, this applies to men and women in daily life, but it's that analogy of the oxygen mask on the plane right totally you really really need to look after yourself because if you don't like Jess said you are going to be the cranky grumpy mum no one wants to do that turn up as a good mother or partner no and no it's not it's you know there's a lot of elements to why grumpy mum appears and it's not just nutrition (laughs) but nutrition plays a role for sure and if we are lacking energy if we're like yawning and 
something happens, how are we showing up? Are we responding? Are we reacting? And what place are we coming from? And it's one of the biggest things I, you know, I, I work with mum about mums with nutrition, but it's also around their nourishment and how full their cup is and what is it full of. Uh, like holistic nourishment rather yeah, than food. Yeah, yeah. not just yeah. food because so many things impact that. And I feel like that, yeah, could be another whole um, topic as well. But talking into what you were saying around your increased hunger in pregnancy, and I find that one of the most irritating sayings in motherhood is like, just you wait. I'm sure you've had a few people say that. To, oh, just you wait until this happens. or And you're just like, honestly, but... I'm going to not... Did I put that... I didn't even put that in the questions I sent you, did I? No, but I feel like, you know, if you say that to anyone, like, oh, I'm so hungry now, people will say, just you wait until breastfeeding because breastfeeding, hunger, it's a real thing. And so that's another sort of stage of um, focusing on those fats and proteins. And I don't even feel like I really got to um, talk into the fats as much as I wanted to before, but... There will be space, I'm sure, in another podcast for that. But yeah, Lewis, I still haven't asked you about butter yet. Oh yes, so I did, but we moved on. Yes, fat and butter, Jess. Whenever suits you. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's an amazing book called Nourishing Traditions. Have you heard of that by Sally Fallon? Oh no. Yeah, it's, it's so many notes everywhere. Um, it's the Western A. Price, basically, foundation behind it, who was a holistic dentist yeah. who basically discovered through looking at the dental cavities of traditional cultures he figured out what people were eating and he is a huge advocate for those fat soluble vitamins so we're looking at vitamins a d k2 and e and so when we look at butter um, in nourishing traditions she calls butter the queen of fats especially when it's from grass-fed cows which luckily here in new zealand it all is predominantly Um, and so that means it is loaded with those fat soluble vitamins as well as selenium, copper, zinc, DHA. And when we look at a baby and their brain and their growing brain that we are growing both in pregnancy and then through in postpartum through either breast milk or formula milk, uh, their brain is made up of nearly 60% fat, so specifically the fatty acid DHA. And so its role in cognitive function is really important for children Um, as most of their brain growth is completed by the age like five to six. So when we look at uh, a breastfeeding mother in particular, the type of fat that she is eating in while breastfeeding, while lactating, that directly corresponds with the fatty acids in her breast milk. And so it shows like there's such an importance of fats. And I think... I sort of touched on it before about we've been so led astray with our food and encouraged to sort of disconnect from our instincts and what we know and understand. And I've worked with women who were cutting the fat off their meat and they thanked me. You know, I've had a mum come back and say, I feel the best now I ever have in postpartum. And she's been eating the fat on her meat instead of cutting it off and others have been like choosing all low fat options and it's important to understand that fat gives us that long lasting satiation after meals meaning that we feel full for longer but we also need fat for so much and especially mothers and babies fat really is queen um you know looking at hormone health nourishing our breast milk our skin health brain development and for many women it can be really supportive for warding off constipation which is something that's really common in pregnancy postpartum and for babies it's common across the board and so so Jess can I pause you there yeah tell me more say fat for constipation because women well and men but women you're like what do you mean I can eat bacon and eggs I have to eat high fiber cereal because it keeps me regular yes well constipation is you know like having quality fat in there is one of the things that's I'm trying to think of how I can word this it's an actual lubricant yes, right no, well, this is how I've learned about it in the yes. science it's a lube fat a lube for your poo it's a lubricant yeah it is <laughs> it's a lube for your poo and so that's why really a lot of the store bought and store prepared 
baby foods, um, a lot of those are essentially just steamed or boiled vegetables. And so they're all missing the fats in there that are really helping our children to avoid constipation. And so, yeah, we, we want to think about healthy fats as the lube required for healthy digestion to help keep things moving and keep things regular. Um, yeah, <laughs> to, keep, to keep it nice and lubricated down there. Um, but one of the most sort of like fascinating things around fat that I want to share with you is around, well, share with your audience, because I'm sure you already know this, Amy, but around the nutrients and foods being fat soluble. So it, mm. it's really fascinating to me too, because it's not something I knew was that the nutrients in foods, some are fat soluble. And so this means like, the better carotene in carrots, for example, let's start there, that they are fat soluble. So this means we must consume it with fat to get the benefits of these powerful antioxidants. And I can tell you now, if I say butter on our carrots, butter on our carrots, and it's the same with like kale, the antioxidant kale, it's fat soluble, the lysopene in your tomatoes, fat soluble. And so the fat soluble vitamins are really important to help us absorb those, but also the fat soluble vitamins, which are your A, D, E, and K, which are all rich in butter and ghee, they require fat for absorption as well. And so with ghee. This is why egg whites are stupid. Yeah, on their own. I still do use them in cooking and when I'm being lazy. Yeah. But yeah, people, so women come to me and they're like, I'm not allowed to eat that many eggs. How do you eat that many eggs? A client who's actually two weeks in and lost a couple of kilos turned around to me the other day and went, Amy, can I just ask, how are your cholesterol levels? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, pretty good, thank you. But so the, the misconception of the fat um, in the egg, you know, oh, vitamin D, it's so crucial for so many of our hormones. Yes, so many. And I, like, I, was, so many. I was reading this morning uh, in preparation for this around the egg yolks and I – I'll have to find it to share it with you. But I was talking about a traditional culture in China and what they do for postpartum mothers. And they recommend postpartum mothers eat mm. 10 eggs a day. And I was like, I feel like New Zealand is so far really? from that. And um, yeah, the, the egg yolk is kind of like, I sort of partner it up with liver in the terms of it's like a multivitamin. You know, that is where all the goodness is, particularly the choline, which is the part we want. I've already talked about that for the brain development um, in pregnancy and also in like when your baby's starting on solids as well. And so, oh, yes, the final thing with butter I wanted to share as well was if you struggle to tolerate butter, I personally really love ghee, which is made from butter. Yeah, butter. clarified butter. And so it's sort of got like an almost like caramelized flavor and it retains all the vitamins in there. However, it's easier to digest because it doesn't have the milk sugar or the milk protein in there. So for those who are sensitive to dairy, it can be a great way to still get those fat soluble vitamins without actually sort of getting tripped up by the snotty nose that can come with dairy intolerance. And for mothers in postpartum, a baby's digestive system can be really immature to begin with. And so it can be a great thing for a mother who's in postpartum, who's breastfeeding um, to support her in that stage. And also for a baby starting on solids, it's one of my sort of favorite fats for them to begin with as well. Because I think one of the things that is so, you know, um, not, well, it's becoming more widely known, but, you know, not all fat is created equal. And so I really hope that the, I'm going to say woman, but the people listening to the podcast understand that there's a big difference. When I say fats are important, yes, they are, but the type of fat matters. And there's the fats that are really pro-inflammatory. And then, then there's, and then there's these really beautiful traditional fats that really nourish our health and give us all of that absorbed them. And Jess, have you got time to go down this rabbit hole for a couple of minutes? Oh, because... yes. I just checked the time and I'm like, holy hell. No. <laughs> no, that was a genuine question because if you do, I think so many people, I thought this might be a long one, yeah. um, probably don't know this, these things. When I say to people, 
um, do you cook with canola oil? Yeah. A lot of them do. Yeah, it's cheap. That, and that, do your thoughts that, just quickly. You know, it's, it's the cheap option. Um, and what we know about these vegetable oils, so that's, yeah, it's the canola, sunflower, safflower. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Canola, yeah, there's a whole list, which I can, I've written Those a blog. The main ones, aren't they? Yeah, a blog on it. And you're going to find these foods, uh, these oils used in most takeaway cafes, supermarket foods, and they do drive our inflammatory markers up, but also, before the like actual process of getting creating that fat or that oil it leads to that oil being rancid basically before we're even using it in the pan like before it's even hitting the pan it's already rancid it's just really not serving our health and it's something like personally I do try and minimize my intake of it but it's not something I'm going to like if I go out for a meal I know that it'll be used with vegetable oil sometimes like it depends what mood I'm in I may say could you cook my meal in butter and oftentimes they're happy to but it just depends it depends where I am and if I have the energy to have that conversation because often they'll be like you want it cooked in butter and I'm like yes please <laughs> so yes it's yeah. actually better for you than vegetable oil yes. you're braver you're braver than me like I think if I sat with Scott and was like can I just ask whether my eggs are about to be kicked in canola or butter? He'd like kick me out of there. Um, yeah, but it's most cafes do. I remember asking a really, really beautiful, healthy, trendy, organic cafe in Auckland. Canola oil. Yeah. But they cook my eggs in. I don't, I don't <laughs> know. I don't know. And like, you can taste it. Once you go off it, you can taste it. Yeah. And um, yeah. The flavour is just, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't taste, doesn't taste great. And so I find instinctively with children as well, which is it, like nourishing my children has been, it's just like, I just love it. I, I really just, yeah, that like to hear them say, and I don't share much of this because um, I try to keep my children out of my business as much as I can, but they say you things. do really well for the business you're in thank you because yeah. like it would be very easy for me to share share them and share who they are and how they nourish themselves you know but they will say things like you know I want the fatty bit or I need my body saying it needs some pate you know and to reach that point and I'm just like yes my work here is done <laughs> you know that's um, so cute because how old is Alexander like four four yeah four? Yeah, poor, so he's yeah. poor. Yeah, and so um, it's just like I've said to the mums I work with, it's like this isn't just a random food. This is just the way we eat. It's just a food that my children are going to grow up, you know, like liver isn't something I grew up eating at all. And so it's it's now a food that we eat regularly and my children will build their relationship with it because they're seeing it and they're seeing me eat it. And that is the biggest part of the puzzle that's often met, missing is like, parents putting these foods down and then why aren't they eating it and it's like well you're you're their guiding light you're all that matters to them really and so are they seeing you eat that food and are they seeing you eat it and go oh yuck that's disgusting I'll never eat that and then sort of like forcing them to eat it it just doesn't work like yeah that. so that's a bit of a tangent on from the fats but yeah um yeah, I, I love that conversation, though, because you get so many mums who are like, they just won't eat. They mm. just won't do this. They just won't do that. Or all they'll eat is. Yeah. And I think. Oh, yeah. Whatever children. Yeah. Eat. You, you know, that they have had to have been introduced to it yeah. at some stage. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And often another thing that comes up a lot with the woman I work with is like, they do all of this effort for their children's meals. And then when it comes to their own, they are making exceptions to their food that they wouldn't make for their children. And one of the things I get them to sit with is, why would you feed yourself something that you would never give to your children? Why are you not valuing your own health like you are theirs? Yeah. Yeah. It's a big question for fun. Okay, Jess, okay. before... Before we do the takeaway desserts, because we're yeah. going a bit long in the tea. Yes. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, your thoughts, personal question, totally selfish question. Yeah. Your thoughts on the first 40 days mm. 
I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. I think if you can honor it, if you can protect it as much as you can, this is going to be your initiation by fire into boundaries and motherhood. So we personally chose not to have any visitors for a set number of days and I'm not going to actually share how many because it has to be something that feels right for you but honoring our boundary and our bubble of just us and having that time uh it, it was just magic and I think it triggers a lot of people especially older generations who are expected to come and hold the baby um and get the token photo and I personally believe I shared this on my Instagram a few days ago you know stop holding the baby go and hold the mother like that is what you need to go and do because she is the one that needs to be holding that baby that baby is just growing inside of her for nine months or ten months you know for that 40 weeks and then yeah. when they come out everything is new everything around them is new the only thing that is familiar for them is their mother the smell of her the sound of her is like their home and then how can we protect that and like yeah the further I get in my journey it's like creating I see women creating these beautiful altars and sanctuaries in their bedrooms of a place where there's like tables bed tables you know like that you can have Um, cups of tea that don't spill and things and like really intentionally creating a space where you can rest and lie and be with your baby and not have any demands on you no visitors no hosting nothing other than like that pure bonding and skin to skin like it's one of the most underrated uh, strategies in parenthood that you can use you don't just have to limit that to the first 40 days you can use that throughout your child's life of like bringing them back to you because yeah like I said yeah. you're their their home base and it's something I'm sure you can hear my voice but I'm very passionate about it and about yeah. um honoring the child and the baby in that time and what is actually supportive for them and you know having you know advocating for what's what not what's right but what is the most sort of um supportive entry into the world for them and is that yeah. streams of visitors, you know, we had a, a sign on our door that said, thank you for coming to visit. We'll let you know when we're ready for visitors. If you've got a gift for us, please leave it at the door. And that is such a good idea. My best friend, yes, actually, I she wrote it for me because I was like, oh, I'll be really blunt <laughs> in that. Because that's the back <laughs> the corner in me. But she was like, she wrote the words really like, yeah, really gentle and, um, and it, yeah, it was a, it was great, and it just sort of it took the pressure off me because I knew that all I had to do in the day was lie down, and we had a lot of support around us, and I'm so grateful for it because I I truly think it, it um, impacted my entire postpartum and how I feel now. Um, yeah, it's powerful. Yeah, yeah. I will be honest. <laughs> this will probably make just laugh because. I kind of watched your postpartum journey slightly as you started to share things because you went offline for a little while, yeah. did you, sort of? Yeah. Yeah, intentionally. So I, I noted that. And then a lot of Jess's content was this amazing, magical, you know, information about the first 40 days. You must have posted something about it. And then when I found a book called The First 40 Days, yeah. I was like, okay, what is this magical time frame? I'm going to take a read. So listen to the audio book. And I will be honest, a little bit type A business Mm -hmm. owner from London, I was like, well, I'll be back out walking in three days. And how soon can I take them to a cafe? And when can we have friends around for beers? (laughs) And I read those books and I was like, oh, good God. It makes so much Mm, sense. Like women are women, (laughs) mothers these days try to get back to it as soon as possible because they feel like that's what success looks like. Mm -hmm. They're emotionally exhausted. They're physically exhausted because their body's still got a massive wound inside Mm -hmm. that's trying to heal. They're trying to breastfeed. They're trying to get to know this new little baby. Mm -hmm. And they've let the rest of the world in. Yeah, it's so much. And I think... Way too soon. It's a conversation as well. And this may not resonate for some of your audience who haven't 
sort of looked into this before, but the between the the masculine and feminine energies we all have within us, and the masculine drives us to do do do, get it ticked off, and the feminine is more. Mine's mine's way too shouty. Hello. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> the feminine's like you know the being, the receiving, and how can we just stop and be in that moment and in this modern age and day that we live in like the masculine is what is valued and it can be really challenging for women to to stop and you know I know this all too like it wasn't um as easy second time round because I obviously I have a, another child who's home with me all the time and so it had to be really intentional and I think if I share that, it's showing you that you can do it first time, second time, third time. It's all about communication and setting those boundaries and knowing why you're doing it. You're not doing it because it's selfish or you're lazy or anything like that. It's because this is what you need. And that time, oh, I get teary just thinking about it. It goes so far and it's like this precious little moment of, a blip in time that you won't get back and how can you honor that and make it something just like it's kind of bleeds into like what I talk with about with mothers about with their own self-care I'm like if I tell you to go and have a bath you're probably not going to do it and it's the same thing with the first 40 days if I say go and lie down in the first 40 days as much as you can you're probably not going to do it but if you if I say to you go and get some candles, get an audio book or a podcast or your favorite book, get a beautiful cup of tea, put some Epsom salts in the bath. You're more likely to do it because there's more factors to look forward to. It's the sort of same thing with the first 40 days. How can you set up your bedroom to completely support you in this space? Can you get some really lush pillows? Can you get a nice blanket? One of the best things actually is like a long cardigan that you can wear and wrap around you and baby. But as you're like, slowly moving around the house you know how can you make your postpartum nest for example like let's call it that I think I'm I think I'm doing okay at that part I, well our baby our baby's going in the media room because we're out of bedrooms um but I'm kind of setting it up with that in mind yeah nice so it's a space I can spend the day yeah and in the middle of the night that's hopefully going to be comfortable, yes. plush, yeah, a really nice place to spend time that I can close off, yeah, and lock if I want to. So full privacy, yeah, um, amazing, yeah, amazing. And then it's, um, the bonding is just it's it's magical, Jesse. Like the way you've just described it, it's exactly you must have read that book the first forty days. Yeah, it's a great one. At some stage, yeah. Yeah, and they talk about even it's um it's an ancient like Chinese birth doula almost. Mm -hmm. Was she the lady behind it? I can't remember. So the author's um mother or grandma, I think, or aunt. Um, just the way they describe everything, but it makes so much sense. And they talk about how women, if they do as little as possible, like you say, not be lazy, but intentionally nurture themselves. Mm by moving as little as possible doing as little as possible mm -hmm. so being with their baby rather than trying to do mm -hmm. lots they talk about how the mother emerges so much more beautifully both physically and mm -hmm. emotionally and it actually often means there's less of a traumatic time mm -hmm. when it comes to the menopause mm -hmm. oh yeah because and, yeah yeah like it's crazy that that's linked, but I can totally believe it. Mm. Oh, absolutely. because you've healed more fully. Yeah, and I think it's actually not. Um, it's not down to the individual mother either. It's a societal thing of we expect too much of new mothers, and we don't hold them in the way that we could hold them. And yeah. it's not an expectation we have. You know, we expect to go around and see the baby and maybe drop off some food but probably not and I think honoring people's privacy in that time of like you what right do you have to see this new new life that's in the world like right now the only thing that matters is bonding with their parents and no, it's nothing to do with you and it, um, 
it's really hard too because I think it's the mother then has to start communicating this is my expectation these are my needs this is you know please come around and you're making me think I've got like six weeks and I really need to start putting that out there yes and like um you know messaging people and saying I'd love to see you um when I'm ready or if someone messages you and says how can I help it's saying please come and put some washing on or you know I'd love a meal drop to my door but it's yeah it's it's we're so far from that that I feel like mothers don't feel confident in advocating for themselves in that way and they're just like oh okay this is just what's happening and so often the partner's family often causes troubles <laughs> for a new mother because it's up to the partner to communicate the mother's needs and maybe they don't get it right or they don't articulate it or they don't want to and there's so many layers to it but um, yeah anyone in your audience who wants to reach out to me I'm, I'm all about helping mothers to set boundaries and I have had many difficult conversations with my parents and my mother-in-law um I feel like I'm well versed in them now that they sort of just laugh at me now they're like oh what is it this time (laughs) because (laughs) they know that I'm doing things so differently that they expect it now rather than sort of getting triggered by it which is a great place to be in that they can um yeah they can receive my my news so it's about honoring what feels right for you in that space and right for your baby because it's the first opportunity you're going to have to advocate for them I love that Mm. I think we should finish finish that section right there and so final final chapter yes takeaway dessert for our listeners Jess what are your takeaway desserts for people Mm -hmm. do you have where you've already shared kind of that you've got an incredible pate recipe a favorite recipe or any takeaways for future mothers or women in general yeah beautiful definitely my chicken liver pate and my chocolate curd if you haven't made that yet then it's necessary i keep seeing yeah it's worth making and it's loaded with egg yolks and ghee so Um, It's kind of like in breastfeeding, you will notice your hunger going up. And so it's like, okay, well, how can I eat so that I'm getting those extra calories that my body needs right now to nourish my breast milk in a way that I'm not eating a huge amount of food that's actually not filling me up or giving me what I'm just eating donuts. Yeah, yeah, because you're just going to find the crash that comes with those and you're not actually getting, your body's going to keep looking for those nutrients. So I found early postpartum, I was eating curd from my thermomix like I just couldn't get enough of it and my body it was just going straight out of me and now I can eat it and I'm like "Mm, damn that's good (laughs) but it's not I'm still (laughs) breastfeeding and so I can feel my body still wants it but it's not the same pull that it was in those early days and I feel grateful to be able to listen to my body in that way um and I guess that is really my key takeaway for mothers future mothers and women what I want them to know is listen to your body and listen to what it's telling you and listen to your child's body too because they know more than we do you know they haven't had any of the conditioning and so um, if they listen if they're telling you something about their body like I'm full now how can we listen to that and respect it and honor what our bodies are saying Mm. I think that's powerful place to stop there Jess I wish we could go for another (laughs) speaking of breastfeeding I've got a baby who's probably waiting for me so I better go but let's talk talk (laughs) again um about yeah about toddler baby nutrition that would be a fun conversation to have that would be a really fun conversation my godson is two and I know the Kylie sorry I'm going to name drop you in here the the slight traumas she had with starting solids things like that she wanted someone to come around her house and show her what to do yeah so let's definitely earmark that for the future amazing jess thank you so much thank you for having me and all the best with your exciting few weeks ahead thanks i'll be in touch i'm sure yeah i look forward to it i probably i won't talk to anyone else but i can have jess on speed (laughs) dial yeah i would i would love that amy anytime (laughs) okay cool thanks a lot jess bye bye Thank you for listening to this episode of the Lifestyle Design Secrets podcast. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please do stop and take two seconds to subscribe and leave us a review. 
it means the world to us. If you are curious about working with us or checking out our new bite-sized guides or our full body reset transformation programs, please do head on over to our website, which is www.amysfitnessandnutrition.co.nz. Have a great day.